AFN Kwajalein did a recent interview with a former Quaj kid who's made a name for himself as a marine scientist and discoverer of more than a dozen species of fish. Brian Green, a 1998 Kwajalein High School grad and former RTS Optics employee, talked to us from his home on Oahu about his background and what goes into tracking down those elusive fish in deep mesophotic waters. My day to day is I, I do environmental consulting as a marine biologist. I also do research with the Bishop Museum, University of Hawaii. And normally when we're not in a COVID shutdown, I do a lot of traveling around the Pacific doing research projects. You know, after, after leaving Quaj, I went, I went to the University of Hawaii to study marine science. And I ended up switching to zoology because I was more interested in, in the animals. And right around that same time, I started uh, getting involved with rebreather diving. So I, um, actually started a nonprofit research entity called the Association for Marine Exploration that allowed us to use these high-tech rebreathers to do science diving when the university system wasn't ready for us to do that. And since then, I've been on uh, you know dozens of expeditions all over the Pacific, from the East Pacific and Costa Rica to Indonesia, everywhere in between. And um, my team, we have a very small team of uh, you know dedicated fish nerds that I, that I do this stuff with. And we, we, uh, we try to do you know, two, two to three expeditions a year to find new species of fish in different locations. And how did your interest in marine biology first take root, um, during your time out here, I imagine? Yeah. I mean, growing up on quad is the perfect place to get interested and learn about that, that kind of stuff. And like I said, I moved there when I was six months old. So I had early exposure my dad kept aquariums on quads when I was a kid and he was a scuba diver and he got me into it real early and would take me snorkeling off North Point and I started learning the fish and when I was about eight years old a book was published called Micronesian Reef Fishes by Rob Myers who was living in Guam at the time and my dad got me that book and I started learning all the fish in that book and I made it sort of my mission as a kid to try to find every species in that book um, and also right around that same time when I was really getting into it, uh, a, a quad res resident named Dave Johnson actually discovered a species of fish that was unknown to science. And when I heard about it, uh, and I heard that uh, researchers from Hawaii were actually going to name it after him, it kind of blew my mind as a kid that you could actually find a, a species of fish that nobody had ever seen before, and, and scientists would name it after you. I had no idea that you could do that. In this video, we see Green and his team at almost 400 feet in depth hunting a type of triggerfish. You're down deep and you capture a, uh, I think it's a triggerfish, and it's really nothing more high tech than just a couple of small nets. Yeah, video that the equipment that we're using to, to make the dive to get that deep uh, is very high tech. The you know electronically controlled closed circuit uh, rebreathers. Uh, but the actual uh, collecting equipment that I use to capture specimens is, is very low tech. And it's, uh, it's nothing more than what I used to use as a kid, like catching fish for the, my aquarium at my house on Quaj. Uh, it's just a couple of hand nets, but it, it takes a lot of practice. It, 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 um, there's very few of us that uh, have done it long enough and have the skills to catch pretty much any fish you, you see. On this expedition to the Philippines, Green and his team captured a new species, and his colleagues named it after Green. Yeah, that's actually, um, that was a new species of wrasse that I, I found in the Philippines at about uh, 350 feet. And uh, it, it, we had known about that species ahead of time, but it was the first time we actually collected specimens. And I didn't actually, I wasn't involved with the science on, on that, actual publication um, but my colleagues didn't did end up naming it after me well you have a fish named after you it exists in the ecosystem how, how does that feel it's a, it's a it's a cool feeling i actually have two uh there's there's another one from uh from kiribati so just southeast of the marshall islands so uh, yeah two fish named after me i mean it's a it's a thrill to and it's a great honor to have that happen um yeah, especially being a fish nerd. Fish nerd may be an understatement, as we see here. Here we go. 
My team and I have discovered dozens of new species. Uh, I, I've personally um, given names to 13 new species. Um, most of them from Micronesia. A few of them, the specimens came from the Marshall Islands. Where did you uh, find uh, those species in the Marshalls, like here on Kwajalein Atoll? Yeah, a few of them. Uh, yeah, actually behind Carlson Island. Yeah. That's nice and deep over there. Yeah, it gets really deep. They, I, I swear it was right at 130 feet. <laughs> <laughs> when you discover a new species, you get to name it. Green named this Tosanoides after his mother, Aunt Patrice. And in 2016, Green and his team discovered another Tosanoides. My, my partner Richard and I found that in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands in 2016. Um, and we named it Tosanoides Obama after the president. I am deeply honored to have this fish named at, after me. How do I pronounce the first part of it? Oh, that's easy. Tosanoides. Tosanoides Obama Pyle, Green Hello. and Kosaki, 2016. <laughs> a marine biologist discovered a new species living in a remote marine preserve off the Hawaiian coast. The fish caught the scientist's eye because of its coloring, because it reminded the scientists of President Obama's 2008 campaign logo. Okay, look closely. The, the reason we chose to name it after Obama was actually the, we were up in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands on a NOAA research trip. And it was right around the same time that, uh, that President Obama was expanding the scope and range of the national monument that encompasses the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and protects them. So we did it as a kind of a thank you to him ex expanding that protection. To get to the, uh, uh, the undiscovered species, you have to go to deep, deep water. Right. And that's well outside the uh, parameters of recreational diving. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a few of the, the big differences between tech diving and, uh, and recreational diving? My team and I, we've, we've all gone through years of training. Um, I started actually technical diving before rebreathers were a, a thing that you could easily acquire. So I was in the early, very early 2000s, I was diving with big double steel tanks and a bunch of tanks strapped under my arms and each one of those tanks had a different gas mixture in it of helium and nitrox depending on what level you needed to do decompression um but you know around 2002 i i switched over to these electronically controlled closed circuit rebreathers which they're high tech and there's a lot of there's a lot of parts that can break and a lot of things can go wrong but it's the most efficient way of doing the, these kind of deep dives because with the rebreather you're breathing your own breath recycling it over and over again so you're not wasting any gas and for us to get down to these these deep mesophotic twilight zone coral reef areas we have to use helium in our mix so we don't get nitrogen in narcosis and helium is very expensive so if you're using normal scuba with a helium mixer, you're just wasting a lot of money and helium's hard to get in a lot of places that we, we do our expeditions. So the rebreathers have really changed the way and they're actually the only way we can, you know, economically explore these deep reefs. Can you explain what your ascent looks like down at 400 feet? Like how many stops, how many yeah. hours? Yeah, so like if, if, to use that Solomon Islands triggerfish dive as an example, um, <laughs> I think uh, I caught that fish at about 385 feet, but I, I probably went to 420 feet on that dive. And that entire dive was roughly five hours long, but only a very small por proportion of that dive is at those very deep depths. So we, we try to go as quickly down to our deepest point in our dive. We only spend a few minutes down there. And then the majority of the dive is a very slow creeping decompression ascent back to the surface. So by the time, I would say uh, 20 or 30 minutes into the dive, we're already on our way into our decompression profile and we'll stop every 10 feet for the next four and a half hours to slowly decompress. Uh, here in Hawaii and up in the Northwestern Islands and some of the other places that we dive where we dive on seamounts, um, 
it's not, it, decompression is not so fun. So you, you only see the bottom when you're at the bottom. And then the next four hours that you're hanging in blue water, hoping a big shark doesn't show up. Since. <laughs> <laughs> Do you just laugh at yourself when you hear yourself talk underwater? Like, how do you keep it under? No, I'm so I, I'm so used to it that uh, I I know we come across sounding like chipmunks, but uh, you know, my team and I we we've dived together enough that we can understand every word we're saying to each other. And, and there's something about the helium in, in the gas mixture that to us at depth, each other's voices sound super clear. They're high pitched, but we can understand every word that we're saying. <laughs> We're not using electronic communication equipment or anything like that or headsets. We're just talking with the rebreather. But the nice thing about the rebreather is you have these double hoses right here, which creates this like resonance chamber mm -hmm. that allows the voice to, you know, carry long distance underwater. <laughs> I see you guys like kind of competing to catch fish. Uh, right. um, you're, I don't know what you guys are doing in this dirty starfish video, but you know, uh, can you explain a little bit about the camaraderie of your team and? You know? Yeah, I mean, the, the, well, to put that dive in context was uh, that was in the Northwest Swan Islands on a NOAA cruise, and we had this amazing 3D multi-beam sonar bathymetry image of this amazing site we were going to dive. And when we got to the site and we dropped over the side and we actually got down to the bottom, it was just a sand flat. So the boat had <laughs> dropped us in the wrong spot. But we're, we're committed. We're at 330 feet, so we're already committed to the dive. We're going to do hours of decompression no matter what. And literally the only thing we saw on that dive was that starfish. <laughs> So it was, it was kind of a, it was an, it was an inside joke basically, but it was, it was fun. So how deep have you gone and where was this? Um, officially uh, 501 feet and th that was at Ponape actually. So do you guys have any intention or desire at all to, to kind of approach the world record, which I think is close to a thousand feet? I have no desire. Um, I, honestly, like, I don't do this kind of diving for to break records or anything. And if I wasn't interested in the fish, I I wouldn't even risk it. Um, I know I know a lot of guys get into this kind of diving because it's kind of a macho thing, but I don't I don't see it that way. I, I I use this kind of diving as a tool to you know study the organisms and explore the ecosystems that I'm interested in. Finally, Green encourages folks to keep on diving, setting goals, and keeping alive the spark that got them interested in scuba in the first place. I would say get all the fish books that you can and start learning fish or corals or anything interesting. Or wrecks if you're into wreck diving. Just, uh, I think if you want to if, if you want to stay interested in diving, then then have a have a goal, have a have a mission, like uh, like I do, like finding fish. Um, I, I've seen people get burned out from diving and uh, it's because they didn't have a mission. Like, buy a camera, take, start taking pictures underwater, make it fun. A big thanks to Brian Green for shining some light on the adventures of deep diving in fish science.